My name is Jason Jaro, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Jason. I forget sometimes that when I'm in a room with us and our people, I can say alcoholic, and you know. Uh, I do a lot of speaking for Oxford House in the public realm, and I always try to say that I'm a person in recovery. Um, as Paul would say, is that politically correct crap. But um, just a couple announcements. I want to welcome you all again to the 2022 Oxford House World Convention. Um, again, your lanyards and name badges are required to enter all the sessions. Please silence your cell phones during the breakout sessions. Um, no side conversations during the panel. Voices do travel, even though they're large rooms downstairs. They're a little bit smaller. Very important, please don't smoke or vape near any entrances or places that are not designated the smoking area, as we all learned yesterday. Um, dispose of cigarette butts properly and safely. Please don't litter. Um, take notes during the session so you can relay the information back to your chapters. Um, and we will have question period at the end of the session. So I want to welcome you all to the LGBTQIA plus panel and the inclusion in Oxford House. Uh, members of the LGBTQIA plus community have lived in Oxford House and have found, welcoming, found them welcoming, but the fact may be that it's not well known. Most members of the panel are members of the LGBTQIA plus community and are residents or alumni of Oxford House. They'll discuss their own experiences in applying and living in Oxford House and discuss the fear and misinformation that does exist. More generally, they will talk about the LGBTQIA plus community and the associated stigma as well as related relevant to topics. We also have a special guest, Saja Ramos. Uh, her organization is focused on training and supporting the LGBTQIA plus community in recovery spaces, and it is a much needed service. And as I mentioned, following the discussion, we will have a question and answer period. Um, perfect. So uh, our panelists today are Nathan Truitt, who's an outreach worker from the great state of Arizona. Uh, we have Jamonte Johnson, who is an outreach worker in Florida by way of Tennessee. Veronica Seppe is an outreach worker in Arizona. And we're so grateful that Saja Alexander Ramos from New Jersey, now in Maine, I learned, <laughs> is joining us as well. Yeah. So I don't know if you were able to catch the panel. Uh, it was the uh, panel for uh, Recovery in America. But SAMHSA has four major uh, dimensions of recovery. And those definitions are health, home, purpose, and community. Health is overcoming and managing one's disease or symptoms and making informed, healthy choices that support physical and emotional well-being. Home is having a stable, stable and safe place to live. And purpose is conducting meaningful daily activities such as a job, school, volunteerism, family, caretaking, or creative endeavors and the independence, income, and resources to participate in society. And then community is having relationships and social networks that provide support, friendship, love, and hope. Those are all important. And unfortunately, if you don't really have a home and a safe place to stay while you're trying to get into recovery or you're in recovery, none of the others can really fall into play and really recovery isn't sustainable. And so that's important for those in the LGBTQIA plus community because for many years, I've known of individuals, uh, especially our trans brothers and sisters, that were scared to come into recovery because of the stigma around those. A lot of us on the LGBTQIA plus spectrum suffer from higher rates of uh, substance use disorder. We use alcohol and drugs to self-medicate. And again, the transgender individuals are especially vulnerable to that. Most of us have co-occurring mental disorders. And some of us, because of our use, or also because of our transitioning and lack of actual medical care and access to that, we have physical and health issues. Some of you may know and some of you may not know that the first pride which Pride Month is June of every year, 
actually wasn't a pride at all. Nothing was prideful about it. It started as a riot. It's called the Stonewall Riots in 1969. On that night was the actual eve uh, of uh, Judy Garland's death, so many also speculate because of the heartbreak and, and the sadness that the gay community felt on top of the raid uh, from the Stonewall Inn, compounded and it came to a head. The person in the bottom right of the picture that you see is Marsha P. Johnson. <laughs> Marsha was a trans individual in the community of New York City, and it's believed and rumored that she was the first one to throw the brick to start the riot. <laughs> one thing that we talked about last year is, and I was just having a conversation with Saja about this, the new information, uh, the, the new data was just released recently on the substance abuse, uh, the National Substance, forgive me, I don't have it down. The National uh, Statistics on Drug Use is, has just been released. I haven't had an opportunity to go through that, but I was just skimming through it and I, I didn't see anything related to this, so I'm hoping that it's in there. So I'm gonna share with you the information from past year of 2019. Now the reason it does seem old, obviously we had COVID, but uh, the federal government releases data a year after they've taken that information, so it's always a year behind. One key thing to note is if you see the top, LGB, the trans individuals are not even captured in the statistics that the federal government looks at. I'm not sure why, I don't have the exact answer, but I think it's important for us to encourage those individuals to start taking part and to be counted in the information that's out there. A lot of it is around stigma, and also a lot of it is because they are, they're not in the rooms, they're not with us because of the stigma. So as you can see here, it breaks down and gives a little bit of the information. Uh, I'm not gonna dive into that because it is old, but I'm hoping that I will have uh, time next week to look into it and I'll certainly post it and get it out there. One of the things that I think is important that I've really tried to include over the last couple of years in our staff training uh, is language and giving the, the outreach workers the tools and resources to be able to address the things that come up from houses. But one thing that really helped me years ago was the genderbred person. And it really helps individuals that don't know anything about the language, and language now is really becoming important, uh, the self-expression, and really what goes on inside uh, the minds of individuals that are struggling. I myself struggled for several years uh, uh, with my gender and what I wanted to do. Um, so it's a pathway for each individual. But seeing this will really help individuals to understand what an individual is going through uh, and what they're, what they're talking about and how it relates to them, because not everybody gets it. <clears throat> If you want to take a picture of this, these are some great resources and links that you can go to. Uh, you know, you can connect with different organizations across uh, the country. And you know, years ago, we didn't really have all of this information. It, 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 it wasn't available. And so I wanted to make sure that we shared that information with you. So I'll give you a quick minute. Another thing that we found, or I found last year, was uh, the Safe Zone Project. And this is uh, a curriculum that you can download and you can also customize it to what you need to fit whatever particular uh, presentation or crowd that you are presenting to. Uh, I personally pulled it down and uh, curtailed it to our staff training last year. And it gives really great information with regard to language uh, and it gave the gender, genderbred person um, and really helped us to open up the, uh, the realm of language for individuals uh, and, and the gender spectrum. So if you have time, go to the safezoneproject.com and you can look at that information. And I'll leave you with this particular flag, which is our new and updated pride flag, which is all inclusive. 
And now we're going to hear from our particular panelist. So first, I will call up Nathan Truitt, who's an Oxford House alumnus, and he's our senior outreach coordinator in the great state of Arizona. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to honestly take one second. Can everyone say hi, Skylar? My son's watching live from YouTube. Hi, yes. Last time he saw me on a TV screen, uh, it wasn't so good. So, <laughs> uh, but my name is Nathan Truitt. Uh, I'm a man in long-term recovery. What that means for me is I've not found it necessary to take a drink or drug since September 30th of 2017. <laughs> When I found out that I was speaking on this panel, um, I was honored, right? Because uh, we just started this panel just a few years ago, right? Um, so it's a topic that's not really highly talked about, but is definitely a necessary topic that needs to be talked about, right? Um, so I'm really grateful to be here. So I'm just going to share a little bit about my experience as being a gay man in an Oxford house. Um, I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of background history on me. So I grew up in a very rural, small town. Uh, it was about 500 people. Um, yeah, it was really small. There's more corn than people. Um, <laughs> uh, and there wasn't a lot of gay people, right? So uh, there was three, about three gay people, me, my stepbrother, and the guy I stole from him. Um, so <laughs> it's really a true story, I promise you. <laughs> um, and, and I grew up in a very unsupportive uh, family environment. So my dad was probably the most homophobic and racist person you would ever meet. Um, and me and my stepbrother were both gay. Um, he had a lot more uh, courage than I did. He came out a lot earlier than I did. Um, and what I had to witness was my family and my dad completely tear him down every day on a daily basis, just continue to tear him down. Um, and me, I was too scared to come out. So I would have to sit there and hear my dad saying, you know what I mean, look at that queer, and excuse me, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but this is kind of the stuff he would say. Um, and it was hard, right? Because and I feel a little guilty about it, but like I would agree, I'm like yeah, you know what I mean. Like I would, I would just kind of agree with him, so I didn't have to, uh, so I didn't have to myself come out and, and say what I was. Um, I didn't come out until I was about 23. Um, it came out in a crazy, <laughs> obscene way. I actually got caught. Um, so and that was back when social media was starting to kind of blast off. So I just put a picture up of me kissing the guy I stole from my stepbrother, um, and uh, that was how I came out, right? <laughs> So early on, um, just kind of how I grew up and like the way, like I guess the, uh, the, the, the defense mechanisms I came up with or had to use to kind of hide stuff, um, I saw play a role in my life even after coming out. Um, so fast forwarding a little bit, um, I ended up moving to another small rural town, Topeka, Kansas. Um, <laughs> Uh, which, and then for some that don't know, Topeka, Kansas is not the most supportive, uh, supportive city for gay people. It's actually the hometown for the Westboro Baptist Church, uh, Fred Phelps, uh, God Hates Fags. Uh, it's, it's definitely uh, not a very supportive environment, but that's where I landed up. Um, and I remember going to interview at my first house, and I remember thinking, I'm not going to tell him I'm gay. Now, at this point, I was out, you know what I mean? Completely out, like, there was no hiding it. But inside, I was like, if I go into this Oxford house and I tell them I'm gay, I'm afraid they're not going to accept me. You know what I mean? I'm afraid that they're not going to, that that'll be the disqualifying factor for me of getting into this house. Um, so I didn't. Um, and they accepted me. Um, I moved in with less than 24 hours clean. Um, it was a very testosterone-filled house. Uh, very masculine men. Um, <laughs> But it wasn't really long after I moved into that house that, you know, uh, it came out that I was gay, right? So they, of course, would say, oh, you know, uh, who are you dating or who's your girlfriend? And I wasn't going to lie, so I ended up coming out. Um, and it wasn't as scary as I thought. Um, it was actually a very supportive environment. Still really close friends with a lot of guys that were in that first house. Uh, that first house is definitely the house that saved my life. They took me in uh, when I had nowhere else to go. Um, but they were. They were super supportive. Uh, I mean, they definitely were throwing jokes and stuff out a lot. Uh, you know, we would order Domino's pizza, and, you know, one of the running jokes, and it was so not funny after a while, was, oh, I bet you Nathan's going to get sausage on his pizza. <laughs> <laughs> but I was able to, I mean, 
another true story. <laughs> um, but they were really supportive, you know what I mean? Like they definitely would back me up if anyone had anything negative to say. Um, they'd be the first to come to my defense. Um, and, and it was a really good experience, right? But I feel that that happens a lot across the country where people who are trans, gay, you know what I mean? Our family, they go and they interview in a house and they're scared to be honest about it because they're scared that they won't get accepted for that. Um, and that's not right. Um, now, one thing that was really cool in Topeka, Kansas is, I mean, they elected me their chapter chair. Um, I got to be really connected within that community, was able to open up some houses, um, is we were seeing like the houses starting to come around in the Topeka, Kansas area. Um, they accepted a trans individual, um, so it was really cool. Um, now, kind of fast forwarding a little bit, so I got to, I was offered the opportunity to come work out in Arizona, um, be able to start a state up from nothing, um, which is really cool because we're not breaking down old behaviors. We're able to kind of start it up and create an area with, you know, how it should be. Um, and our first uh, member that we had in our very first house in Arizona was a trans girl. Um, yes. Uh, <clears throat> she started us off right, um, and we've actually been able to do some really cool stuff. So in Phoenix, uh, we actually just got um, some funding to be able to open up some LGBTQ houses. Yes. So we opened up our very first one, is Oxford House Salation. I think we've got one person here from that house. Um, and it's been really cool, right? Because the feedback that I've gotten from a lot of people that are living in that house is that they are excited to be able to have an inclusive house like that because they're, they're able to be in an environment where they feel supported um, and they're able to feel supported and talk about things that, you know, most normal heterosexual men don't want to talk about, you know, things that only gay men go through. Um, so uh, it's been really cool to see that going. We've been able to connect with uh, Phoenix Pride. Um, we're listed as a resource in Phoenix Pride for uh, recovery housing. Um, we are actually here in two weeks going to be marching as Oxford House in the Phoenix Pride Parade, um, which is really cool. So overall, uh, my experience was actually really good being a gay man in an Oxford house. Um, but I've heard that, you know, it's not always the case, you know, depending on where you're at in the country. Um, so if I could leave you with anything, uh, just stay true to who you are. Um, and if you see something crazy going on or you feel like, you know, uh, a house is not being supportive of, of our family, then, then speak up, right? Because that's the only way we're going to be able to change stuff. So. Uh, with that, I will pass. Thank you, Nathan. You know, one thing I forgot to mention is uh, uh, my sobriety date is November 29th of 2011. And much like Nathan, when I first moved in, I, w I wasn't forthcoming uh, that I was a gay man. Uh, although some people once I told them were like, really? We already knew. <laughs> Um, I didn't think I was that flamboyant. But uh, our next person we have is Jamonte Johnson, who is an Oxford House alumnus uh, from Tennessee and now working in the great state of Florida. What's up, family? Yes, honey. We are here. Okay. So my name is Jamonte. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and what that means to me is that I have not found it necessary to use a drink or a drug since February the 7th, 2018. I'm truly grateful to be where I'm at today. Um, thank you so much for asking me to be on this panel. I remember going to my first panel three years ago, sitting in the back and looking at all the people that came to support the Alphabet Mafia. And, <laughs> and I'm like, wow. You know, I had probably been in Oxford House at that point about six months or so. Um, and so it was just amazing to see how we, ain't, we all came together to make this happen. So a little bit about my story. Um, 
I was an individual, I was born in Paris, Tennessee, a small little country town, right? I grew up with a, a mom, a brother, um, it was not okay to be gay where I was from. And I was black too, on top of that. It was not okay. And so um, at a very young age, I knew that there was something different about me, you know, and I didn't know how to express it. And so my mother was the type that she was very hard on me. And, and even though she had a gay best friend who used to tell her, your son's gonna be one of us. She said, no way, I'm never raising a, and she said some names that I'm not gonna repeat um, in my house. And so that like put me in, in, a, in a closet. I was afraid. And so, um, you know, as, as life got older, as time went on, I started to just grow into who I was. And I was like, look, I'm here. Like, this is me. I'm gonna grow my nails and pop my gum and throw my hair. <laughs> if that's what I wanna do, you know? Um, and so, of course, when I started doing that, I got put out. It's like, hey, if this lifestyle you choose to live, you can't live here. And so, of course, at that point, I just drove into my addiction. That's what happened for me. And so I covered that up with drugs and alcohol. And, um, you know, fast forward to, to bring me to where um, I kind of got in a lot of trouble and I went to jail, I got out, I went to treatment. And so six months into treatment, um, after they had told me that I was about to graduate and that I was gonna be able to go back into the world to do as I please, I thought, yeah, no, I'm not, I don't think that's where I should go right now. Like I'm not in my, I'm not, I haven't been in sobriety long enough to be out there amongst the others because they're still doing the same things. I see um, Facebook, they still turning up. I better not. So the tech, came to me, who was also a member in Oxford House uh, at that point, had said, hey, you should come to Oxford House. I'm like, what is Oxford House? Why, what? And so he told me all about it, right? So here I am thinking, you want this gay black man to move into this house with nine other straight white men? <laughs> they are not, they are not ready. <laughs> I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm not ready, you know, but it was because I still had that mentality that I was not going to be accepted, you know, and so, mm, makes me cry every time. All nine of those guys in that house, I swear to you, came to my treatment center and spoke to me one-on-one -on -one and said, we want you to come and interview at our house. And I was like, why would you want me, you know? And they're like, look, this disease don't see no color. This disease don't see no, it doesn't matter. Come and interview and let's see where it goes. And so I did just that. And I moved into Oxford House Atlantis Abroad, January the 15th, 2019 in Memphis, Tennessee. And I'm so grateful for that. And baby, when I tell you that life took off, it took off. Being there, I dove into Oxford House, right? Because what I learned in my recovery is that I have to stay in the middle of AA. So I want to do the same thing in Oxford House. Let's stay in the middle. I dove into service, right? I became chapter chair within three months of being in Oxford House. Yes, that was me, chapter chair, you know? Um, I got to come to my first, first world convention, not even six months after I'd been in Oxford House, that Oxford House paid for, for me to come to get this experience to bring back. After, and while in, um, in Seattle, I mean, I'm sorry, in DC, I was asked to come back and start a men's house in East Memphis. I was like, man, this is the time for me to train and show these people what Oxford is about. A year after that, I then got voted to the state chairperson of Tennessee. I'm like, God is doing things in my life. I'm gonna stay the course. 
I can't look back, you know? And, and so with this journey, I have able to, I am able to sit down with individuals that come in, that I talk to, and share my experience with them of what it was like for me when I first came in. Because remember, I didn't want to come to Oxford House. But God said, no, this is where you're going. And I'm so glad, I'm, so, I'm grateful for that, you know? Um, I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for Oxford House. And now my job is to, is to teach and train, you know, and show people what it's like. I can relate. I've sat in that chair. I've been there. I've had those thoughts of insecurities. But I know when I get lost in my own self, that's when my program kicks in. It's like, uh-uh, Jumanji, you need to call somebody, <laughs> call your sponsor, another alcoholic, and talk about it. Service work. This is why I'm here. I'm so grateful. So what I say to the individuals that are in here that come to support the mafia, right? The allies, that's a part of the alphabet mafia, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Talk to them, OK? Because a lot of times, people don't know. It's that fear of unknown. So when we don't know something, we immediately like push away from it. So I, let me ask you a question. Who is in here within their first 30 days of Oxford House? OK. One, two. Welcome. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. And so for that experience of diving in, doing service work, getting the state position, I moved out of Oxford House February 2022. Yeah? No. 21. Became an alumni. I stayed active. But there was something that was missing. I missed having house meetings every week. I, I miss movie nights with the guys. I miss football Sunday, even though I, don't, I can't tell you who was playing. I mean, honestly. <laughs> but I was there. Why? Because these guys accepted me for who I was. You know? And so I love that. And then I reached out to them. I don't know if Jeremy with a spoon is in here. But I said, you know what? I got to get back in Oxford. I think maybe I should apply for a job. And that's what I did. I sent my application in. Next thing I know, they call me. Lori called me. She's like, we want to hire you. I'm like, me? Again? Remember, <laughs> this little individual that was afraid and like didn't want to move forward and was, you know, now look at me. Here I am, baby. I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. Mm -mm. I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. So believe in yourself. Right? You start out as a member. You can start out with a secretary, a comptroller, right? Get involved in your chapter. Get to state. Represent. Join this OHI team and watch it work. That's all I got. Thank you, Jamonte. Uh, our next individual is Veronica Seppe. She's an Oxford House resident and also an outreach worker in the great state of Arizona. Good morning, uh, family. Um, my name is Veronica Seppe, and I am a woman in long-term recovery. What that means for me is that I, not, I have not felt the need to alter the way I feel through the use of a drug or a drink since December 10th of 2019. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I grew up uh, in probably what most people would think was a normal family life. Uh, what a lot of people didn't know was, though, was like at the age of four, five, six years old, my I would go with my dad to his drug dealer's house and wait in the living room while him and his, his friend went into the other room and he'd come out with a bag of stuff and, you know, like I thought that was normal. I thought everybody experienced that kind of thing. Um, you know, my dad would have his friends come over and they'd party and drink and get high and 
I'd be down there in the living room while they're doing that, watching TV or playing with my toys. Um, and, and in the midst of all this, you know, I, I knew there was something different with me. Um, I didn't have a word for it, for it. You know, this is the 80s, no one talked about transgender, you know. Anytime you've seen someone, uh, you know, it was usually you've seen a male actor play like a woman role, it was a joke, it was uh, looked down on. And so I took on this feeling of like not being good enough that there was something wrong with me, that I was broken and needed to be fixed. Um, fast forward a, a few years um, later, um, I ended up joining the Army. Um, and that's really when I started drinking, because, um, you know, in the barracks, that's what you do. And, you know, I didn't think I had a problem. You know, everyone else did, but I didn't. Um, you know, I would get just blackout drunk almost every weekend. I try not to drink that much during the week because, you know, I, wanted, I didn't want to be hung over at PT in the morning. Um, to the point where, you know, I would just stand up in front of the barracks right by the picnic bench where people eat and just pee right there because <laughs> I thought, whatever, that's normal, right? And people do that. Um, you know, it got to the point where you know, people, because I was underage, of course, you know, it got to the point where people weren't, only a couple people were even willing to buy me alcohol anymore. Um, of course, you know, I always found ways to get, get drunk. Um, then I ended up actually getting kicked out of the Army after two and a half years that time. Um, then I got home, continued. Um, I didn't really drink as much because uh, I was still underage, but about five months later, I turned 21, and I was off and running again with my alcohol, um, except for now I didn't have, uh, you know, PT in the morning to keep me from getting drunk every day. Then I started smoking weed, um, getting high all the time. Then I ended up uh, stopping both of those cold turkey. Um, and getting baptized because I thought that would help fix, fix me. You know, I thought if I found religion and, you know, I'd be able to be normal, quote, uh, whatever that is, you know. Um, then uh, during this period, I, I met uh, a, uh, this woman at church. Um, we ended up starting a date. She was right off the bat, like I should have known that she wasn't the right kind of person. Um, but I felt that's what I deserved, you know. Um, she accepted the fact that I was, you know, because she was the first person I ever came out to as being trans. Um, and, um, you know, I thought, well, she accepts that I'm trans, so like she must that's, you know, the most, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter if she, you know, treats me horribly or, you know, does, you know, like, just isn't a good person. Um, and then after marrying her, I actually got back into the Army for another six years. Um, and, and mind you, you know, this whole time I'm in the Army, you know, both times I'm in the closet you know, because this is, uh, the first time was like when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was in full force. Um, the second time was when it got repealed or through an executive, it wasn't really repealed, it just an executive order came out, you know, basically, you know, ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell and allowing open, uh, openly gay and lesbian men and women to join. Um, unfortunately, though, they didn't include uh, openly trans uh, people in that um, thing. Um, so I still was in the closet, and it was actually a little bit harder even to be comfortable because, like, 
you know, I could have passed off, oh, I was going to this gay bar because I'm gay, yeah, or, I, you know, I'm, I'm bi, you know, um, that kind of thing. Um, but then uh, I got, um, I got out of the army. Um, I'd been deployed a couple times to Iraq. Uh, was uh, gifted with some PTSD. Thank you, Army. Thank you, Iraq. Um, so, yeah. Um, I I didn't realize I I had it. It took a little bit of time. I didn't realize sometimes PTSD doesn't pop up right away. You know, um, I was actually out for about two and a half years when I started really feeling symptoms and I didn't know what it was. I, I thought I was just losing my mind, you know? Um, I started getting really panicked at being in crowded spaces and being in, not being able to observe the whole room or not being there, being able to like see the exits and entrances and all that stuff. Um, I, I didn't understand why. And it was around this time, um, I was in, Fe I came out to Phoenix, I was going to school at uh, Universal Technical Institute, it's an automotive and diesel school, using my GI Bill. Um, my marriage was falling apart at this point. Um, I just was miserable, you know. Uh, we had a daughter, but she wasn't living with us. She had uh, been, we had brought her over to her grandmother's house because we were getting ready to get evicted for the third time in the last two years. And um, we didn't want her on the streets with us because we didn't know where else we were gonna end up this time. And it was actually Christmas day. Um, I found the a, a meth pipe of, Someone who'd been staying with us and we'd kicked out because they'd been acting crazy. Um, and, uh, you know, at this point, my, my, my ex had been using for some time. She had started originally when I was on my second deployment and um, quit when she found out she was pregnant. Stayed clean for about two years and then relapsed. And, uh, you know, I. Like my, <laughs> I'm so crazy that I wasn't even getting high or, or using drugs, but I would go and pick up my, my her, her meth for her, you know, because, well, you know, she needs to be high in order to be able to stay awake to take care of our daughter during the day while I'm at school, you know, because that's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very codependent, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so anyway, um, Fast forward, you know, that, uh, back to the, you know, school. I'd been in school for about three years and started doing meth. You know, I was like, kind of said, fuck it, basically. Excuse my language, but um, that's, that was my, that was what I, what my thought, oh, that was, I got really close. <laughs> anyway, um, I was on the streets for a, a little over a year um, and uh, just, getting high, uh, prostituted for a little while. Um, then I found uh, shoplifting and, and, and I felt less like a worthless scum after shoplifting than I did after having sex with men for money. Um, so I uh, decided to start doing that instead. Um, then I ended up uh, in US Vets, which is a homeless shelter for veterans. And I found out at that point that the VA actually um, is supportive of trans uh, care. Um, they provide everything up to like all the pre-care for surgery and the aftercare, they just don't do the surgery, um, unfortunately. But um, they, like I get all my hormones. Um, I go, they have like trans support groups. They have LGBT. Uh, QIA plus support groups, all that kind of stuff. It's it's really amazing. And I, you know, at first I didn't want to transition. You know, I, I I still felt like a lot of stigma. I was worried about what the other people in the shelter would think with me, you know, transitioning. Um, but finally, I came to a realization that 
because I I'd been down and out, you know, lose my housing and find a place within a, and get a job in a couple weeks, you know, be back on my feet. But this last time was different. And um, I finally realized that I was done pretending to be someone I wasn't, trying to be something that I thought everybody else wanted me to be. Um, and uh, so I started my transition, um, tr kept trying to get clean, ended up back, ended up going up to Prescott eventually. Ended up going up to Prescott eventually to, um, for treatment, stayed there, uh, got, ended up relapsing, getting caught um, on December 10th, 2019. Um, spent five months in jail. Uh, only got released because of COVID. Uh, you know, went straight to treatment and then to my first Oxford house. Uh, you know, and it's funny because my first Oxford house was actually a really, really sick house. Um, and I ended up getting kicked out, but I immediately got accepted into another house um, where I really started to develop the passion I have today for Oxford House. You know, that's where I really feel my life was saved. Um, I met an amazing group of women. Um, you know, I had uh, the opportunity to help start a new chapter. Um, you know, I was the the female HSC for our chapter. I was, um, I got to open up a brand new women and children's house. Um, I became our, our chapter chair at one point. I also was um, chosen as the uh, chair for the our first state retreat planning committee, uh, which Everyone says went really well, so. Um, <laughs> um, and right around this time was when I, I started really uh, looking at the op option of being an outreach worker. And um, that's when I got, you know, I, I ended up applying and getting hired. And, and it's just amazing, you know, you never know what giving that person that you interview you never know what's gonna come of it. You know, yeah, sometimes, you know, they go back out, sometimes they end up just being crazy and not, you know, working out. But you never know if you're gonna completely change that person's life by giving them that opportunity. Because I know the women that accepted me, even though that first house didn't work out, you know, even though um, I ended up having to go to a, another house, thankfully, like right away, you know, that they changed my life, you know? And, I, and, and I th I'm thankful for that first house because it showed me what an Oxford house shouldn't look like. Um, and so, you know, I'll forever be thank grateful to Oxford House and, and the rooms of AA. Um, I like to say that AA gave me a blueprint to build a new life and Oxford House gave me a place to build that life at. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you for asking me to speak. I appreciate it. Hopefully you'll enjoy the rest of this convention. It's amazing. Thank you very much. And our last panelist is Saja Ramos. She's the executive director for Recovery Organization Resources, and I'm proud to call a great friend. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Oxford House family, for inviting me. Can we get another round of applause for Veronica? I didn't know um, Veronica was a veteran, and, I, and uh, I'm also a Navy veteran, and it takes a lot to, um, you just, he poked me in the mouth with this mic. <laughs> It takes a lot to be a veteran, a uh, service person, and sign up twice. Like that's a, that shows me a big heart, and to come up here and share your story, um, it's it's powerful. And anytime anyone shares their their story, they open themselves up to criticism, and that's hard, right? Because I know for me, a person in recovery for the last eight years, I don't, I still don't like it when. Thank you. 
I still don't like it when people criticize me, you know, even if it's, if it's good, okay, I like it, but I don't like the other criticism, right? So, you know, it takes a lot to come up here because you really open yourself up. And, you know, when you've been beaten and broken down for whatever reason, um, whether it's how you identify, how you express, who you're attracted to, who you love, all of those things are are just about you and and your recovery, and um, it's so funny because you know I've had experiences of being attracted to women. Uh, I shaved my head um, and uh, was like, I think that I'm having a Britney Spears moment. But then it actually, you know, I was having an experience of of uh, being uh, non-binary, and I didn't feel like a woman, and I didn't feel like a man. And now I'm in um, a, a heterosexual relationship, so I'm like, okay, like how do I identify now? Um, and and that's really for me, and it's and that's for me to accept myself and be okay with who I am. And I tell my fiance all the time, um, I'm just like, listen, I might leave you for a woman, so you better like. Keep it on, keep it on straight. But also, like, you know, I get I get attracted to like um, seeing large, um, large uh, kind of lumber. Like, I see lumber on the side of the road, and I'm like, whoa, that's really big wood. Um, so like, and like, and just like seriously, like nature turns me on. Um, and I know it's so funny, right? But like, this is just all about my expression. It's my identity. And when Jason showed you that gingerbread. Uh, gender bread uh, cookie like I'm just like you need another one in there because like I'm like sometimes my heart wants different things and my identity and my express expression and then like I'm turned on by running water and waterfalls so you know where does that fall in the LGBTQIA thing right and I know I'm an ally and I know I'm this but but then I'm like it doesn't really matter right because I know I fit in here with you all and I feel good when I'm with you all because I feel accepted thank you and and that's truly what recovery has been for me. And I didn't, I didn't want to come up here and share my story, but I was so inspired by Veronica, Jamonte, Jason, and Nathan. Um, I, you know, I had a chance to meet Nathan a few years ago when we started doing the LGBTQ listening sessions. And he would show up and just be so like excited to talk about it. And it was when we were all still virtual. And I'd be like, oh my God, I love this man for just like always showing up. And it, and like this thing, it's still small in the recovery community. So for all of you to be here is so, so so amazing. I don't know about you all, but I was reading the um, the pamphlet that we got, and one of the first stories uh, I read was Devin's story. Is Devin in the room? Devin and oh, okay. Well, Devin, um, Devin's story is in there, and it's just so powerful to hear again. The Oxford House. Um, w there are experiences where people have where where they're accepted, and. And I don't know about you all, but I don't watch the news anymore. But I remember, like, last year I was watching the news a lot. And every time I would turn on the news, there was violence against um, a trans individual, an LGBTQ individual. And I'm just like, that just really hurts. That hurts my heart. And, I've, and I have a lot of um, trans friends and community members, colleagues who um, they didn't fare well during, um, during COVID, whether it was because of a relapse or a mental breakdown. And... And like Jamonte said, if you see something, like I really believe in, in saying something, not being a bystander, but being upstand. Hi, Devin, can we get a, I read your story in the thing, and thank you so much for sharing that. Like, I, it's it's so amazing, and, and it gives me hope, right? It gives me hope for the world, because some parts of the world aren't, aren't, aren't a good place right now, so all of you give me hope. So I wanna talk a little bit about the trainings that we are working on, um, and one of the most important things that I remembered in the training is dab. Do you, do you remember dab? Do you remember dab? Yeah, does anybody know how to dab? Anyone? Yes. All right. Okay. Cool. I see it. I see it. So it's our it was it's our three little questions that you can always remember when you're when you're like oh man this is uncomfortable even as a person who's attracted to wood and water sometimes I get uncomfortable I'm like how do I ask how do I say this right so the first thing in in dab is D right which stands for. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask, I mean, <laughs> don't assume. D stands for don't assume. You really never know. And when you think about the uh, gender uh, bread, right, like your attraction might not match your expression. It might not match your identity, your heart and who you love. You might not be ready to share that with people yet, right? So don't assume you think you know. And so that's the, the second, so second one. A, what do you think um, A stands for? 
Yes, ask questions. Um, and as long as you ask questions, right, even if you say something wrong, you're, you're asking the question. Because when you assume, right, and you say to someone, you're like, oh, wow, um, you don't look gay. That's a microaggression, right? And when you say that, that's actually hurtful because because then you can get that person thinking, or you don't look like a lesbian, or you don't look non-binary. They start to think like, well, am I the right thing? Am I doing the right thing, right? And we don't need any more of that in the world. There's so many damn people trying to tell other people what to do. We need more people <laughs> being accepting. And, and, and because you all practice your recovery, you're in Oxford houses, all of you, you know how to, to be accepting. And then the last part is um, D-A-B, right? So what do you think the B stands for? You guys are so smart. You guys are so smart. It's be kind, right? It's be kind. And, and a lot of the times, you know, one of my favorite researchers is Dr. Gabor Mate. And he talks a lot about how addiction breeds shame and isolation, right? So on top of that, imagine it being a part of the LGBTQ community and not feeling safe enough to uh, share your story, to come out. And it's like, it's compounded on top of each other, on top of the trauma that you may have experienced or someone that you know may have experienced. So all of that, it breeds shame and isolation. And that's what keeps people stuck in their addiction cycles. So now we got it, right? D. Don't assume. A. B. Yay. <laughs> Awesome, you guys are truly amazing. The last thing I wanna leave you with is I am on the board of Just Living, which is um, an all gender recovery house in Lakewood, um, Colorado. And um, we are, we are, we're full. We've been full since all of COVID. And I wanna just say that because um, that just shows that there's a need, there's a need. And there's 15 beds there and everyone has their individual bed. But uh, one of our members who's been, who's a, a man, uh, a gay man in recovery, he's about 40 years old. And for the first time in his life, he has a year sober. And he has a year sober. He is a year sober because he got accepted into a house that he could work on his LGBTQ things uh, that he never felt comfortable talking about before. So I'm here to tell you that these spaces, these houses, they work and they need you all to become informed, to be safe, to create safe spaces and be kind or don't ask or ask questions. Don't assume, ask questions and be kind. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Saja. So I hope uh, we shared a lot of information, a lot of personal stories, uh, and, and mostly in the end, they were success stories, right? But we know that's not always the case. And so hopefully what you take away from this particular session is there needs to be a little bit more kindness in the fact that everyone is not always struggling just with their addiction. With sexual identity, transitioning, those particular things compounded on top of the addiction is certainly, uh, you know, it's walking on broken glass or walking on a ceiling that can fall through. So being able to take a little extra time and give those individuals compassion uh, and truly find out what they're, what they're dealing with and how we as people in recovery and supporters uh, can help those individuals move along. So uh, we are wrapping up a little bit early. Are there any particular questions that anyone has for the panel? I believe we have a couple of mics. Uh, if not, uh, if you want to come up to the mic, sir, uh, we'd certainly get your question answered. Hi, I'm Angelica. Um, I'm from Louisiana. I have a question for Nathan. So that um, that house that you were talking about, the um, the the queer house. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a lot of letters. I'm sorry. The alphabet house. Um, is it is it inclusive for anyone? Like, or is it only like could could normies go or not normies like alcoholics that are that are not allies? Yeah, I think it's on. Is it? Hi. Okay. So, <laughs> so it is for gay men and allies in recovery. Uh, so that's what we started out with the first house. Okay. Well, 
is all. Thanks. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. The question is the same here in Seattle. We we integrate and educate, and we're just we wanted to open LGBT houses ourselves, mm -hmm. but what we were worried about was reverse discrimination. So is, now, is that, how are you going to handle that when you come across that? So when we open houses, we don't open houses specifically for just straight individuals or gay individuals. Their houses, they're, they're or for male and female, right? So if an individual is identifying on the spectrum of, of part of the alphabet mafia or a particular trans individual, then that trans individual has a right to interview at whatever house they feel comfortable with. Uh, and then a gay individual or a person on the alphabet mafia can interview at that particular house. Does that make sense? So it's not just gay friendly houses. It's it's there's there's is that making sense to what you're asking? Okay. Yes, sir. So I'm John David from Asheville. I had a question. Uh, Nathan mentioned issues that come up for gay men in a house. I live in a house that has a wide variety of uh, ages uh, and attitudes towards the LBGQ community. Mm -hmm. How can we educate? the folks in that house to what those issues might be and being sensitive to that. Are there any resources out there? What would you suggest in our house meetings or whatever while we're in our daily interaction? We definitely have some training materials that uh, we can get to your outreach worker uh, to help facilitate that. Uh, certainly coming from uh, compassion uh, and letting those individuals know that language matters. Uh, and, and, you know, while it may be uh, just shop talk, Barbershop talk is kind of how they used to refer to it, or mechanic shop talk. Um, language matters. And just as a person in recovery faces that stigma, person also on the spectrum of, of an alphabet mafia will, will face that stigma as well. Uh, my name is Cheryl from Spokane, Washington. Um, hi. Our question hi. is um, how or what steps do we take to go about opening an LGBTQ house in our area? So again, we don't we don't have houses specifically just for LGBTQ. It would be an inclusive house. So it would be what's called oh, a friendly okay. house. Yeah. Okay. And then my other question was, um, aside from that that curriculum that you showed, is there any other suggestions you have for us bringing back um, information to our houses to help them be more open? So a lot of the resources that I showed there are great resources to give information. Um, Sasha and I uh, and a group of other individuals have been working on a uh, recovery housing training for LGBTQIA+. Uh, it's not done yet. We've been working for a couple of years on that. Um, because uh, really, besides the Safe House project, uh, the Safe Zone project, that is just really for materials, but it's not recovery house related. There's nothing out there. There's no curriculum or any information out there about recovery housing for the LGBTQIA+. So we've been working with other individuals to try to pull resources from the listening sessions, excuse me, uh, to get that information so that it is a tool or resource out there for recovery housing. Great, thank you. You're welcome. My name is Jared from Wichita. And so one of the issues that we run into is that um, it is in the Bible Belt, right? And um, so I'll, I've had two trans women that have come to me and asked me to like help them get into a women's house. Mm -hmm. But then a women's house will turn them away and tell them to go uh, interview at a men's house. And then the men's house will turn them away uh, because they're like, okay, well, what does it say on your driver's license? So I was just wondering if you have any suggestions on how to end that stigma, especially like in a very conservative area. Yep. So several years ago, when the conversation was just really starting in recovery housing, at least for Oxford House, um, that was the stance in regards to who could interview at what house was, was the, and quite frankly, the genitalia assigned at birth. But we've evolved with that in the fact that just because you have that particular genitalia does not mean that's what you identify as. And so what we encourage houses to do is that if an individual is identifying uh, on a trans spectrum, then they can interview at the house that they feel most comfortable with. Um, I, I, as far as the stigma, the stigma is always going to be there. I think really giving the education and materials and sharing that information with them 
uh, working with your chapters and finding out which houses may be accepting of that and then really trying to spearhead uh, and direct those individuals that come to you to a house that's more supportive. What I have seen happen, and Washington State is a great example of that, because we had a trans individual that interviewed and she decided she wanted to live in a men's house and that men's house was very accepting of her and they were very, very protective of her. Okay. Um, and you know that's where she felt most comfortable. Um, but they really set the standard for the really the country as far as Oxford House is concerned to open themselves up and, and show you know it's possible and it can happen. Uh, but you really just sharing the information and once you find those supportive individuals, continue to get those individuals involved and sharing the, that that's what helped breaks down the stigma. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi. Hi, oh, sorry. Hi, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Jill. I'm from Austin, Texas. Um, I'm heterosexual and um, I'm very open and non judgmental. And sometimes I use the wrong words. Where can I learn? So the Safe Zone Project uh, really gives great, uh, I mean, they give a glossary of definitions of what it is. And so uh, I uh, am a person, I'm a gay man, and I still use sometimes the wrong language. So uh, it's something that language is becoming more and more forefront of what we're, we're talking about. Uh, and just for example, you guys, right? That's a common... Uh, statement that we say in a conversation um, y uh, and y'all is better right I'm from the south and, and, and I still say you guys but saying that is it, it, you have to be conscious of where you are so it's really making that conscious effort but that glossary I will say from the safe zone project is really good okay thank you yep uh, yeah I don't have a question I got kind of a statement so my name is Tasha Burton and I'm from Pendleton Oregon um, so I'm trans female, been on the hormones for three years, and uh, I interviewed at a women's house. They accepted me. I've been living there for a little over 11 months. Uh, one of the questions the house has, uh, so if there's any discriminations, right, you don't belong in the house, right? If you got a discrimination against anybody, color, race, sexual identity, you don't belong in the Oxford House. So for any of them states that are out there saying, you know, you was born with something else, you don't belong here, you know, that's not right. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, I'm Teresa. I'm from Longview, Washington. Welcome to Hi. Washington. Um, so I live in a house where we have trans women in, their, in our house, and um, we love her two fucking pieces we love her so her language um but our chapter doesn't seem to accept her and they spread rumors about her and so this is kind of a question and a statement kind of but um so how do you deal with a chapter who doesn't see it or starts rumors and then um what we did being petty bitches sorry um we took her we took her to chapter with us when i went to chapter i'm the president of my house so i was just like fuck it let's just go to chapter together you know like just all just go together and just sit next to each other because they say we cuddle with her and we're all sleeping with her and whatever. So we're just petty. So we just brought her to the chapter meeting and we all just sat next to each other and just you know put our arms around each other, you know? Um, how do we deal with that? In an Oxford house, especially with hetero, was it heterosexual people all on the panel, you know, mm -hmm. or the, not panel, but the chapter. How do we deal with that and make it to where um, they stop the rumors and stop those things without being petty or, you know, <laughs> any of so, those things. So I think the, the, the easiest answer is you would treat them just like you would treat it as a situation for a newcomer or a person that, you know, is, is, is on Matt or Mar, right? Like you involve them. You show that those, that those rumors aren't true. This person is recovering. Yeah. Uh, this person is worthy. Uh, and just, Show them the good time. Show them the fun. Uh, just like a sick house. You know, how do you get the sick house to turn around? You involve them. You start doing things with them. Show them uh, that those things are, 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 it's better. And it's, you know, what they're, what they're talking about is not true. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Lead by example and be the change. Uh, hello. Hi. I'm uh, Bam from Louisiana. And uh, what's up, y'all? And uh, Nathan... Y'all were saying Nathan had just, uh, we recently opened up our first, you know, uh, LGBTQ house, but then, you know, you were saying how it's not necessarily an LGBTQ house, it's a friendly house. Correct. So, and as 
my boy or whatever, him up here in the Tata shirt, he was saying, shouldn't every house be a friendly house? Correct. So, yes, but just, just I, to... I, I asked because I'm chapter three chair, so I'm just, I'm kind of, and I just got put in position, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to make some changes, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> So I think just just starting off is just remembering that you know it's it should be inclusive. All, all houses should really be inclusive on any spectrum: white, black, gay, straight, uh, male, female. Should be inclusive. Yeah, great. Okay. Yep. So, all right. I just wanted. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Ryan Portland. Um, uh, this is definitely interesting. I didn't know some houses were accepting trans. Or what about for the UAs and stuff like that? So it, it would fall on the same spectrum. If, if they're in a house, those individuals choose to, uh, I'll just say this, UA is not part of the Oxford House model. So if the house chooses to uh, issue a, a urine analysis, then it would follow the same particular guidelines that they're, they're, they're using. But again, the Oxford House model doesn't call for drug testing. It's really based on behavior. <laughs> it took me a long time to get to that because where I came from and where I moved into a house, we had a random every week. So drug, drug testing was a part of the, what was instilled in it. And if you're not addressing the true behavior, then you're only putting a banding on it. We know how to pass tests. We know how to get one over. But if we don't change our actions and the way we respond to things, then we're not growing in recovery. Yes, sir. Hey, my name's Mac. Um, I am a member of the LGBTQIA2S community. 2S. <laughs> uh, I, I live in Seattle. Welcome, everybody. Um, I think these two uh, folks just ask my questions. Um, I guess my concern is that, like, we say that we're not discriminatory, but we also say we divide by gender. Um, that feels discriminatory to me, to folks who are AFAB or AMAB. Um, so I'm curious when, uh, and I appreciate everything you guys are doing, mm -hmm. um, but when does this training come out? So, I think it needs, to, I, I'm sorry, but I was in a house that uh, a guy had a Nazi flag in his room, and I didn't feel like I could come out to them as a gay man, um, and I relapsed out of that house, because uh, they were telling jokes that were offensive to probably everybody here. Uh, and that's in Seattle, so I don't know what happens in the Bible Belt, but it's shitty here. So, so we're we're picking up the conversation again. So I I can't tell you when the training will come out, but we are definitely starting those conversations again now that we've reconnected in person. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. If you go to the microphone, yes. Oh, sorry, I, I was distracted. That, that's Squirrel. okay. Squirrel. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Will, Yaquina Bay, Newport, Oregon. Um, so we, as we all know, when we interview someone and they don't get in, the only thing we're supposed to say to them is that you didn't get an 80% yes vote. Mm -hmm. no, nothing more, nothing less. Okay, that's simple enough. But in the when you're a member of a house, I mean, you guys talk with each other, right? And, and it comes out your reasoning behind why you voted no for that individual. Okay, I live in a small town of like 10,000 people. We're the only Oxford house in the entire county, and people talk, you know? And so my question, the que to get to the question, and forgive me, because I don't, my, the language is not part of my lexicon yet, but um, a gay man comes to our house and he interviews, he doesn't get in, some of the guys are talking, you know, they're talking out in public, it's overheard, it gets back to said individual, now they know that they were not voted in simply because they were gay. What recourse do they have? So, as I see our general counsel walking down the aisle, <laughs> I'm gonna say that, you know, that's, that's, that's hearsay. I, it, okay. Again, it, it's speculation. You don't know the cause, and really the only reason uh, that the individual should be talking uh, in their house is whether that person's gonna be conducive to the recovery of the house. Right. That's, Jason, unfortunately, you, that's not you, always the case. Let me just. Because people are Look, jackass. Look, uh, hi, I'm Steve Poland. Uh, you, may, you may have heard me yesterday. 
Uh, unfortunately, we had to deal with this situation. So, so here's the deal. Uh, residents are interviewed not on the basis of their sexual orientation, not on the basis of their gender, not on their basis of, of, of anything else other than are they going to be a good fit in this Oxford house? Do they want to be in this Oxford house? And if any of your house members start in, when they're debating whether to vote this guy in, starts talking about someone's sexual orientation, you all have an obligation or duty to shut that down, okay? Shutting it down is one thing, but actually changing their mind is something well, else hold entirely. Well, I mean, you can think whatever you want to think, all right? You know, we, we are not the thought police. But if it, if it becomes a public, if it becomes a discussion, all right, in that House meeting, if somebody says, you know, uh, you know, who have, uh, who either has um, some sort of bias against gay people or some sort of fucked up understanding of what it's like to live with a gay person, they express it and the House adopts that and denies it and it gets out to this guy and Jason says it's hearsay but that's enough to get a, a, a housing discrimination complaint filed, okay? So you all have an obligation to shut this down and to educate and say, we're not here, if, if you don't, you know, the bottom line is if they don't like having a gay housemate, maybe they're not a good fit in Oxford House. Thank you, Steve. And that's, that's another reason why we have this particular panel and we're sharing the information and resources is so that you can bring that back to your areas to be able to educate and share the information with them to hopefully break down the stigma. Um, we know, just like the stigma of around Matt and Mar and recovery and you know, people in recovery or people in addiction is out there. It's not going to go away. But we have the responsibility and we're giving you the tools and resources to help break that. So we have uh, time for one more question. Oh, no. Hey, everybody. My name is Sam, and I live in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, Oxford House Ramalog. I'm really glad to be here. I'm really glad to, to be able to be at this panel. Um, and I feel like a lot of my questions kind of already got asked. Um, so I just wanted to say, I, again, thank you to the panelists. And I really long for the day where we no longer have to have these kind of panels. It's yeah. never you know I long for that I day mean, as well. Th and, and also thank you for mentioning that maybe we're not all success stories. Yeah, I just You know what I'm saying? Because our journeys are so different and we exist at these intersections. Guidelines. Thank you so very I, much. So I, I hope we can keep I, addressing those intersections and making them be less important as we move to, towards recovery. Thank you for hearing. Thank you very much. I have a really... Thank you, everyone. When do we get gender inclusive? We, we don't have time for any more questions. I'm sorry. Non-binary. I'm sorry. Um, I, I do have something to say and I'm just going to share it anyway. Um, that I am, sorry, but um, I am in the LGBTQ house plus house in Phoenix, and I just want to say that we have a 50-50 ratio with gay and straight members of our house. We do not discriminate when we interview people. It isn't even a question. It's all about reaching out in your community. If you are part of the LGBTQ plus community, you know where to go for a Lambda meeting if they have Lambda in your area. You know how to reach out to your local community. And it's about reaching out and working together. If you're interested in forming an LGBTQ house, I would suggest reaching out within your community and getting in contact with the right people and just working together and not discriminating, always following the Oxford model. There's nothing different about our house than any house. We hold each other accountable. We have chores. There is nothing different. And the straight men that are in our house are completely accepting of every member that every other member in the house. And we respect each other's boundaries. At the end of the day, it's about respect and unity. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.